أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ورضي الله تعالى عن سادة التابعين وعلماء العاملين وعائمة الأربعة المجتهدين ومقاليدهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته تريسا إماري إدريس الحمد لله مرحبا وكم Baron, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We are very close, very, very close to the end of this book. I don't know about you all, but every time I'm going through a book and it seems that we're getting close to the end. I get kind of sad. The book ain't going nowhere, but I don't know. This is a weird feeling. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Safiya and Sidi Nasir. This next portion of the book that we are going to cover today. It highlights the importance, it highlights the importance of the places that we find ourselves. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Zanaida and Khadija. We should be very cautious and careful and selective about the places where we find ourselves. As Muslims in general, but the more responsibility or the higher our rank is, the more cautious we have to be. We shouldn't be in every place. Because the Sheikh today, he's the section we're covering is avoiding the places of innovation. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Fatima. Meaning those places where blameworthy innovative acts are taking place. And just to highlight, I want to remind you of something that happened before the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I'm pretty sure probably all of you have heard this already probably heard it many times. How many of you have heard the hadith of the man who killed 99 people? Really a hundred, but the man who killed 99 people. How many of you heard the hadith before? Wa alaikum salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hakeem, Um Nadira, Stanley, Samira, you heard it. Stanley, you heard it. It's a well-known hadith. Um Nadira, you heard it. Khadija heard it. Mari, you heard it. It's a well-known hadith. Teresa, you haven't heard that? Wow. 
Fatima, you've heard it. City Nasir, you've heard it. I'm not familiar. Zanetti, you ever heard that? SubhanAllah. MashaAllah. I was going to summarize it, but now you, you, some of you haven't heard it. I'm going to read it. Hold on. It's in Riyadh du Salihin. It's one of the first hadith in Riyadh du Salihin. It's in the section on Tawbah, repentance. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? There it is. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa Farooq, alhamdulillah. Shukran for joining us. Now, the original place where the hadith uh, was collected is in Bukhari and Muslim. I'm reading from. We are the Salihin, the Gardens of the Righteous by Imam Anawi. It's Hadith number 20. So it's in the very beginning, the second chapter of the book, which is dealing with Tawbah or repentance. I'm not going to read the Arabic. I'm just going to read the English. Uh, and it was narrated by uh, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who relates that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a person from amongst a nation of the past had slain 99 persons. Inquiring as to who was the most learned person in the world, he was directed to a monk who had given up the, who had given up the world. And so, pause in, in reading the English. This person had killed 99 people. He wanted to make Tauba. He wanted to repent. And he asked the people who was the most knowledgeable he literally asked, who is the most knowledgeable of the people around here? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam directed him, I mean, excuse me, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the people directed him to a rahib, which means a monk. And with one thing you have to keep in mind when you're reading these hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam means what he says and says what he means. What the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his speech is jawami'il, like in the hadith, he says, to be Jawami al I have been sent with very comprehensive speech. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Malik, alhamdulillah. So he asked who was the most knowledgeable person in the land, and they directed him to a monk. He went to the monk or the hermit and said, I have killed 99 persons. Is there any chance of repentance left for me? The monk repli replied, no. The man killed the monk also and completed. I'm changing the translation. This translation is weird, right? It uses a lot of English terminology that we don't really use anymore, right? It says here, the man killed the hermit also and completed a century of his victims, meaning he killed 100 people. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Zakaria and Nadil. I see Zakaria, you in these YouTube streets now. Okay. Alhamdulillah. The killer asked again, who is the most learned person in this world? He was directed to a learned man. See, the first time he asked, the Prophet Sallallahu clearly stated that he was directed to a monk, a rahib. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, after he killed the monk and asked again, he was directed to Rajulun Alimun. That's the exact words of the Prophet Sallallahu Fadullah ala Rajulun Alimin. A man of knowledge. In the first instance, the Arabic says, Fadullah ala rahibin. He was directed to a monk. The second time, he was directed to a man of knowledge. In other words, they directed him to what he asked for.
Accordingly, he went to him and asked and said, I have killed 100 people. Is there any hope of repentance left for me? The learned man said, yes, nothing can stand between you and repentance. Now, this hadith, especially those of us who've been Muslim for a while, we know we heard this hadith a whole lot of times. This hadith is pregnant with me, with, with blessing, with lessons and, you know, things that you can take from this, right? This hadith right here. I mean, so we can literally, this hadith right here, just me, myself, with my deficient, having no knowledge self, I could give five Juma cookbars back to back, nonstop, just on this hadith alone. It's so much stuff in here. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, free slave. And Yahya Abdul Jami, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah. Good to see you in the building, alhamdulillah. And so I'm fighting myself to stop, fighting myself from stopping, from commenting on every point. Because everything that I've read so far is not the point of why I mentioned it today. But I just, I just can't help myself, right? This right here, right? I'm sure none of us know anybody that killed 100 people. We may have known people that killed somebody or even some people. But even most uh, mass murderers that we've heard about haven't killed 100 people. Even with the uh, invention and technological so-called advancements of of weapons of mass destruction, not too many people have killed a hundred people. And we talking about this is ancient times. So if he killed a hundred people, he got to get up, up close and personal. And this, in spite of what he did, right? The man of knowledge told him that there's nothing that can come between him and repentance. And as Malachi said, it gives me hope. It should give us all hope. Because a lot of times shaitan wants us to feel dejected and like there is no hope. I done did so much dirt, ain't no getting back from this. Not too many. We might have done some foul stuff, but I doubt if any of us can say we killed 100 people. Walaikum salam, Kenny. So continuing, he said, proceed to such and such land. In this land are pious people who worship Allah. That's the whole reason why I mentioned this part right here. But I'm going to finish the hadith because some of you haven't heard it. Join them in the worship of Allah and do not return to your home country because it is an evil place. The man started for this land. He had, he had covered only half the distance when he met with his death. A dispute uh, arose between the angel I should say angels between the angels of mercy and the angel of punishment, angels of punishment, because the angel of death, like a lot of these big angels whose names we know, like Malik and Jibril and all these big angels that we know that's in charge of different things. It's not like they're doing stuff by themselves. They got they got command of other a angels that work under them. Right. So the angels of angel of death has that has angels of mercy and punishment that's that's working with them. And depending on the person's state is going to determine which group of angels is going to take the soul of the person. So these angels uh, got into a dispute as to who should take charge of his soul. The former pleaded, meaning the angels of mercy, pleaded that since he had come as a person, as a penitent, meaning somebody that's in the state or trying to make tawbah, turning towards Allah, and the latter contended that, and think about what this person, what, what the angels of punishment said, look at their argument, said that the, that the deceased had never done a good deed these angels ain't liars, right? So everything that these angels are saying the truth. He tried to make Tauba, but he ain't never done anything good, right? Well, like I said, this gives me hope, right? It should give us all hope. This person never did nothing good.
innahum lam ya'mal khairan qat subhanallah innahu verily he lam ya'mal he never did anything khair qat he never did anything good nothing whatsoever wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa Some of us, as foul as you or I may be, we did something good, right? This person never did anything good. On top of the fact he killed 99 people, 100 people. Then there arrived an angel disguised as a human, and the contending angels agreed that he should be the arbiter between them. He directed them to measure the distance between the two lands. To whichever he was nearer, to that one he belongs. So in other words, if he was closer to his destination at the time of his death, then the angels of mercy would take his soul. And if he was closer to the place where he left, the bad place, then the angels of punishment would take his soul. So they carried out the measurement and found the land of the pious persons to be closer. The angel of mercy, the angels of mercy took charge of him, says Bukhari and Muslim. And then uh, in another riwayat, it says fi, fi, fi riwayat and fi sahih. And another narration that is sound or in, in, in the sahih says that he was found to be closer to the land of the pious persons by the width of a hand and was thus accounted as one of them. Another version is that Allah directed the space on one side to expand and the space on the other side to shrink and then said, now carry out the measurement. So in other words, according to one narration of the Hadith that Allah commanded the earth uh, in between the land in between where he was where he died at and from where he came to get bigger and the land uh, from where he died at to where he was going to get shorter or smaller and then said now carry out the measurement it was found that he was nearer to his goal by the width of a hand span and was forgiven it is also related that he came closer by crawling so the end of this narration the end of the story there's different variations on specifically how he got closer to the land to which he was going but all of them agree that he was closer to the land in which he was going so he was forgiving who was forgiven the person who didn't do any good the person who killed a hundred people including a monk right a rahib a pious person he was forgiven and so the reason why i mentioned that hadith is because one one of the things, the first thing that the uh, the man of knowledge told this person was that you got to leave where you at. You can't just stay around. This, this is place where you live is foul. It's an evil place. He said, for in Talik ila aradi kada wa kada, for inna biha unasu yabudun Allah ta'ala, fa budi lahi ma'ahum. He said, let me go back. He said, Nam, woman Yahulu Bainahu Abaina Tauba. What uh he said, yes, and what can come between you and Tauba? Then he said, and leave uh the land of Kathawa Katha. So it's such a such land, meaning the land where you come from. Right? From leave and then go to uh such a such land. Because in that land are Unasu Ya'budun Allah, who worship Allah. Then he said, Fa'bud, then worship uh, Allah, Ma'ahum, worship Allah with them. So, in other words, leave where you at and go to where these righteous people are at. They are worshiping Allah. You don't just go there and sit there with them. You go and you worship Allah with them. 
very comprehensive advice. And so the reason why I even mentioned this whole narration was really to highlight that part. And we can't ignore or we can't downplay the type of places in which we find ourselves. We can't be trying to be righteous, can't be trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we still find ourselves in places. And I'm not necessarily talking about like cities, right? But just environments in general where all types of fahsha and munkar are taking place or all types of evil and sins taking place. It's not going to work out. And everybody has their different thresholds of how much evil they can be exposed to before it begins to take an effect on them. This is extremely important. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Abdul Kareem. Alhamdulillah. I can't, I can't highlight this part enough. A lot of times we don't want to change our environments. And we wonder why we keep having the same problems. We wonder why we keep having the same problems. So I, I want to I wanted to begin with mentioning that hadith and highlighting the importance of changing your environment. That's one of the first things that the man of knowledge told this man who killed 99 people. And again, it's one thing to be, you know, to change your company and, get, and, and have good company, but you don't just sit there and just think just because you're in the company that you're good. No, you have to start doing what they're doing. A lot of us, sometimes we change our company. And we change from bad company to good company. But when we get around good company, we still doing what we used to do when we was with the bad company. We don't do what the good people do. We don't do what the good people do. We are around the good people. And sometimes people are fooled because we are around good people that we're good too, but we're not, we're different. Like we were talking about last night, we have on that mask and we are around good people. So people think that we're good people because we're around good people, but we still have the old habits that we picked up and that we perfected when we were with the bad people. No, when you change your environment and you get with the good people, do what the good people do too. He said, go to such and such land. In that land, there are people who worship Allah. You worship Allah with them. Extremely important. So now uh, in this text, we're on page 57. Avoiding the places of innovation. Of the Bidnami Shaitan Rajim, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Kalamu Alaf Rahimullah, Ya Ikhwani, Ya Kum Bidhaha Bi Il Maudi Il Bidati. Wakulu manage. Tama'a fihi rijalu wa nisa'u min nika'i wa aqiqatin wa janazatin wa sadaqatin lil mayyiti wa ghayri thalaka min wa min mawadi ijtima'ihim mimma la yuhsa tilka al-sadaqatu lati ala hadhihi al-halati la tanfa'u al-mayyita wa fi uh, Risala Risalati Muhammad ibn Yusuf ibn Ibrahim Naam Sadakatu Tanfaul Mayita Ijma'an Lakin either Wafakati Sunati Wahia and Taf Allah Bihari Jam in Nasi Wafi Risalati Abi Muhammad wa la amalun wa la niyatun illa bi muwafaqati sunnati wa kadhalika al fida'u lil mayyiti in waqa'a bi ghayri jam'i al nas wa illa fala illa li annahu bid'atun 
Oh, my brothers, be aware of going to places where innovations are being practiced. Malika said, if it is too much of a fitna, we can make hijra to be around people of benefit, not necessarily to a Muslim country, whatever is practical, inshallah. And I agree with that. And uh, maybe we could talk, maybe, maybe we could spend a few minutes talking about that after we meet. Um, everyone, man or woman, Whoever attends these gatherings, regardless if it is a wedding, a childbirth ceremony, akika, which is akika, uh, a funeral, or even giving charity on behalf of those who had already died, or other than that, from among their gathering places, which are innumerable, must know that the sadaqah which they give in that situation where blameworthy innovations are being practiced, does not benefit the dead. <clears throat> so in other words, what the Sheikh is saying, all of these types of gatherings are gatherings which the Sunnah supports. A wedding, an akika, a funeral, or even give, giving charity on behalf of the dead. And he spends a few seconds talking about that here uh, in a few lines later. Giving charity on behalf of the dead. He said, if there are innovations taking place in those gatherings, and he's talking and he, he makes special mention of giving charity on behalf of the dead, you're going to undermine the whole reason why you went there. Because it's not going to bring any benefit to the dead. And then he says, in the Risal of Muhammad ibn Yusuf ibn Ibrahim, the author says, yes, Sadaka does benefit the dead by consensus, by ijma. And this is only when it is consistent with the sunnah. And that is done without gathering the people. In the Risala of Abu Muhammad, so one, there's, there's another Risala. In this Risala, he's speaking about the Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd, Al-Khairawani, which is mentioned in a footnote here. If you're reading along with it, it says footnote number 64, which is, uh, which is uh, Ibn uh, Abu Muhammad, uh, Ibn Abi Zayd Al-Khairawani. Abu Muhammad Abdullah Ibn Abi Zayd was one of the people of North Africa. Uh, Abu Zayd's name was uh, Abdurrahman, according to Ibn Makula and Qadi Ibn uh, Hadda. He was from the tribe of Nifza and lived in Al Khairawan. So, in the Risala, it mentions, and the Risala was originally uh, a basic uh, Islamic book, primarily fiqh, which was written for uh, young teenagers not necessarily like young children, like six, seven years old, but a little bit older than that, right? It's basically like a, like a handbook or an Islamic manual. And so he's quoting the, the author of the Risala, actions and intentions are not complete or acceptable unless they are consistent with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the footnote we mentioned here, the complete statement is as follows. The statement of belief is not complete without actions. Actions and intentions are not complete or acceptable unless they are consistent with the Sunnah of the Prophet And this is actually mentioned in this in the section of the Risala where it's talking about Aqidah or the proper belief. Likewise, that's the end of the quote, likewise, it is the same as paying ransom, fitta, on behalf of the dead. If it occurs without gathering people, well and good. However, if a gathering is made out of this sadaqah, then it is an innovation. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Felicia. And this is something we do all of the time. Giving sadaqah or doing something on behalf of the dead. 
can anybody tell us uh, when do we normally do it here? Or even uh, with Imam Amin, we do it all the time. Paying something or doing something on behalf of the dead. When do we do that? The person's dead. Obviously, they can't do anything. We, we do things on behalf of the dead with the intention that it will benefit the dead. Alhamdulillah. All of you are saying, reciting Al-Fatiha. Exactly, reciting Al-Fatiha. When we're doing that, we're asking Allah to give the reward of that recitation to the, to the dead. Because we know it benefits them. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So let's recite al-Fatiha and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the reward of this recitation to the shaykhu, the author of this text that we are benefiting from. Alhamdulillah, sealing the Quran on their behalf, exactly, wasn't that, you give an example, Samira, uh, recite Al-Fatiha for benefit and blessings, yes, so Alhamdulillah, uh, Sister Malika mentioned something about uh, making Hijrah to, uh, I don't necessarily, necessarily have to be an Islamic country, but it, it could be for the, like, uh, what was her words? Yeah, if it's too much fitness, whatever is practical. And you see this happen over and over and over in Islamic history. Uh, like, for example, even with the, the, the biography of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some people, it was too much fitness to remain in Mecca, so they made Hijrah to Africa. They made Hijrah to, Hijra to Abyssinia, right? That was the first Hijrah, even before the Hijrah to Medina. And in fact, there was two hijras to Abyssinia. There was a there was a hijra where only a few people went, and then a rumor went out that the Quraysh had become Muslim, and then some of them had came back. And when they got close to Mecca, they realized it was just a rumor because something actually had happened. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reciting Quran in the presence of the disbelievers. And then an ayat of prostration came. And they were so caught up in a recitation that all of the Quraysh prostrated. So that news spread. And the, 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 uh, the, the rumor went out that the Quraysh had became Muslim. So some of them came back from Abyssinia only to find out that, no, it wasn't the case. And then so some of them just stayed in Mecca. Some of them went back to Abyssinia and a whole bunch more people followed them to Abyssinia, a larger uh, migration to Africa. And so, and that place wasn't a Muslim country. That place, in fact, was a Christian country. The ruler was a Christian until he took Shahada. And Najashi, Abja ibn As Asham ibn uh, Abja ibn Asham was his uh, name. So alhamdulillah. So, and then you had the Hijra from Mecca to Medina. where obviously the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself made that hijra. Even the hijra of this author, he made hijra from uh, Degel to Gudu. And this place where he made hijra to, it wasn't a separate territory that, he, that you know, like a lot of times we understand things in the context of our present situation. During the time of this author, the author, there was no such thing as a nation state. We're living during the time period of nation states where there are boundaries drawn on the map and this is this country and that is that country. Real life don't really work like that. Real life don't really work like that. In real life, borders are changing every day. Sometimes other, you know, 
another country expands and takes a little piece of that country, et cetera. So real, real life doesn't work like that. But the point is that when the Shehu himself made Hijra, he didn't necessarily move outside of the control of Bawa, who was a, a ruler at the time. He moved to the outskirts of his authority. In other words, when his where his authority wasn't at, so strong or as enforced and solidified the Jamaat. Uh, I ain't no Shehu, uh, Abdul Kareem. I know you're just saying it out of out of respect, but I definitely ain't no Shehu. <laughs> Abdullah. I don't even consider myself a student of knowledge, really, really. For real, for real. Now, as you're saying, Philadelphia, for real, for real. Reciting Quran or Salawat upon Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on someone's behalf, would it be uh, correct to do? There's nothing wrong with that. And Allah knows best. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Muhammad. Zakaria, what is the def definition of gathering? In other words, gathering a group of people for that purpose. That's true. They just changed the name of South Africa to another name. I didn't know that. I did not know that. So the point here is that a lot of times we need to stay out of places because it's not we we, we a lot of times we uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, we compartmentalize too much. There's some places we should not be going. How many of you know that? How many of y'all know that there's a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reported to have said, uh, uh, "None of you believe. None of you believes. Uh, uh, whoever believes in Allah, Allah in the last day should not sit in a place where drinks are being served." Samira, can you post that hadith? Like we feel comfortable, too comfortable in places where sins are being done right in front of our faces. Like my family, we stopped going to Chuck E. Cheese because of that. Chuck E. Cheese is supposed to be a place for children. Then they started serving drinks and stuff several years ago. Come on, man. This ain't, uh, what's the other spot? Was we got the big grown up games with the drinks. Now we got a Chuck E. Cheese, you know, kids playing and adults getting drunk and acting a fool. Samira, did you hear me ask you to post that hadith? If not, I will do it, inshallah. I mentioned this, so I don't want to just throw it out there without giving people a source. Alhamdulillah. You're quick. Alhamdulillah. Jabir reported that the Prophet, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, he who believes in Allah in the last day should not sit to dine where alcohol is being served. This is was mentioned by Ibn Kathir in his tafsir of Surah 4, chapter 140, chapter 4, 140, and is collected by Imam, Imam Tirmidhi. Hello, Earth to Samira. SubhanAllah, I haven't seen it here yet in Jersey. Uh, we were still living in Philly when they did that. Most sports events here serve liquor. You attend the game and people are drunk driving home. That's one That's one of the main, like, I, I stay away from those spots. Some place, because we live, I mean, this place, we surrounded by, they inundate us with stuff. But we do got control over some of the places we go. Zachariah, what the text is saying is there is a reward normally when you do these things, but if there are also blameworthy innovations taking place when you're doing these things, you remove the reward from, from you, re, you remove the reward for doing it. In other words, if those things are taking place, then, you know, uh, I mean, if you, uh, let me reread your question again. Is the text saying 
there's no reward when reciting al-Fatiha or Qatam al-Qur'an on behalf of a dead person in the gathering. For example, if I'm with some brothers and we get together and recite, yes, that's what he say. And the reason why he's saying no reward because the gathering of the people for that purpose is uh, a blameworthy innovation in the school. So you can recite Quran or do cut them of Quran for the dead person, but not necessarily gather for that purpose. That's the point. In the Maliki school, you find a lot of the predominant rulings are like that. Like for example, uh, in the school, like uh, we nece don't necessarily do vicar in Jamaat in one voice. Vicar in Jamaat in one voice. You know how you get together and do a vicar circle and everybody's in unison doing the same vicar? They call it like Sultan, Wah Sultan Wahid in one voice. We don't do it in one verse. Even if we were together for the vicar, we would be doing it individually. Even in the Eid prayer, for example, you know how we be, get, we be gathering for the Eid prayer? We were like, uh, and we do the uh, Talbiya, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Wa lillahi alhamd, right? Like that. You know, we used to do it all together in one voice. But in our school, that's a blameworthy innovation. We should all be saying it separately. It should, it should sound like chaos. It shouldn't sound like we all singing it together, saying it together. Right, Zachariah, Shakran, and Allah knows best. Afwa, Allah knows best. That's the name of the place I was looking for, Dave and Buster's. The, the adult Chuck E. Cheese. I couldn't think of the name of the place. You know, in a deep thing, in a deep, in a, in a deep thing about that, because a lot of times we can't control it. When I get on the airplane, you know, certain people always got a drink, right? And I'm like, oh my God. I just increase on my in my supplications. You know, Allah, you know I ain't got no control of this. <laughs> you just support Allah. And I just mention that as an example. Uh, but sometimes there can be other blameworthy in innovations taking place. Like some of these gatherings take place, and there's you know unrestricted intermixing, intermingling between the sexes. Like even a Muslim gathering, there's no drinks being served or whatever. But, you know, you know, some of our gatherings, some of us are a little bit more loose than others. Right. No. Subhanallah. I remember. <laughs> Subhanallah. I ain't never see it myself. But when I first took Shahada, uh, I know I mentioned it here a few times. Uh, one of the chaplains who used to work on Rikers Island. Uh, I used to think he was cool. I didn't know no better because he used to curse, like literally, like F words in the kutbah, like literally, right? SubhanAllah. Right? But he was also the, an imam of a masjid, a, re a regular masjid in the street. And I got, I can't, I got to ask around New York and see what, what's up with him and see if that masjid still exists. I never, I haven't heard anybody mention that masjid for decades. But in any case, they uh, they used to have like events, you know, like in the masjid, like what I mean by events, like music playing, dancing, right? Like literally, like, you know, like literally dancing and you dancing with your wife and then, you know, another brother dance with your wife. These are older people, like the generation, like my parents' generation, right? Dancing. Or brother, you mind if I cut in? Sure, I don't mind. Go ahead. And bro, bro, brothers be dancing with each other's wives and stuff. This stuff used to go on there. Subhanallah. Uh, you know, a lot of Muslims are loose like that. These are Muslims gathered, right? That's obviously a blameworthy innovation. We shouldn't be in places like that. And I understand, you know, I'm talking from the perspective of the Maliki school 
some of these things, of course, not the last example I gave, but uh, some of the things that were mentioned previously, right, uh, may not be an innovation in some other schools, right? You know, and that's, you know, above my pay grade. I'm just mentioning what's, you know, according to our school, right? So sometimes you're at, a, you're at an event or a program or a gathering for uh, whatever purpose and it's good, when stuff like that starts to happen, if you can't change it, you have to leave. You have to do the SpongeBob meme. They always quote, all right, I'm going to head out. I've seen scholars and Aulia do the same thing. Like, for example, I give you an example. Uh, in our school and also according to our uh, Torika, specifically our branch of the Torika, the Kaduria Torika, like we don't, uh, uh, like I mentioned, like doing zikr in Jamaat and stuff like that. We don't do that. And a lot of other Tarikas do. I'm not just, I'm not saying that to put blame on them. I'm just saying our branch, we don't do that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but there are other, there are other branches, even of the Kaduria Torika, where they do do that. Sometimes they will come in a masjid with the duff and they be doing the sheeds and, you know, dancing and, you know, praising Allah, sending peace of blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I've seen like some of our sheikhs, you know, they, they you know, when, when, they, when they come through doing that, you sometimes you have people that that's what they do. They come to certain masjids and certain villages, they come and this is what they do, right? And I've seen some of the Shiyuk and the Aulia, when they come through, right, you know, they politely excuse themselves, you know, and they just, you know, head out for this reason. Because according to their school, their opinion, their Torika, that is a blameworthy innovation, not necessarily a haram innovation. And we talked about innovations in the beginning, the beginning of this book, right? There are categories of innovation. There may not be a haram innovation, but in, in our school, it may be a makru innovation. So in any case, they, they just head out. You don't need to stand up. Oh, look at love. Stop this. Oh, my God. No, just calm down. I just is not your thing. Leave. But if it's something like blameworthy and like evil, like we talk about, like dancing and people dance with each other's wives and all kind of stuff, you know, if you don't have the ability or the position, people don't respect you enough where you can't stop it, then just leave. And I was trying to think of examples of that off the top of my head of, you know, a gathering where innovations like that, you know, innovations take place and, you know, and the, the purpose of the gathering may be good. Like he gave examples of a nikah or an atika, you know, or a janazah even, right? All of these things are highly recommended to attend. But if they start doing blameworthy innovations at that event or that program, then we shouldn't be we shouldn't be there. And this is why education is is extremely important, because a lot of times people don't do these things because they they're trying to be sinful. It's just their custom is what they normally do or what, what have you. And so we should always be educating people and we need to also uh, replace a lot of these blameworthy customs with praise, praiseworthy equivalents. That's one thing that I've noticed. Mo at least uh, I haven't been too many places in Africa, just a few places, but a few places that I have been, at least with regards to the wedding parties, usually, and events like weddings, uh, walimas, even Akikas. It may be other type of innovation that take place, but like the intermingling usually ain't there. Usually the sisters are way off someplace else, you know, getting the wife prettied up and all types of, you know, woman stuff going on there. And the actual wedding ceremony is usually in a, in, in a, in a masjid, 
right? In the masjid, the brothers, the wife usually ain't even there. And usually somebody, you know, goes to deliver the message. Okay, y'all's married now or the, the nikah is complete. You're married, you know, right? Then party time starts. Then maybe the blameworthy innovations may happen, right? Then, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Jahali music may come on and all that kind of stuff. But usually the ceremony itself usually is cool. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my brother Isa. Salam, uh, Hanafi Asa time. Alhamdulillah, I'm getting out of here myself because I have to get ready for the Black Imams Roundtable in approximately 36 minutes. Exactly, just like with Maulid and Nabi, which is uh, the celebrating of the birth of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some free mix with the sexes, dancing, reciting nasheeds, etc. It's not my stilo, so either I don't go, or if I find myself in that situation, perhaps a master is hosting a maulid after salat or asr or something, I'll just leave after asr before they start putting up the banners, cakes, and loudspeakers. Exactly. Alhamdulillah. A lot of people be going on campaigns because we know celebrating the, the maulid, you know, amongst ahl sunnah, we know it is ikhtilaf, it's difference of opinion. Right? Contrary to what you hear, popular popular speakers saying because it's a danger sometimes we get an ahl sunnah and we go to the other uh, opposite extreme of the wahhabis in ahl sunnah there's a difference of opinion like according to sheikh uthman denfodio celebrating the 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 maulid meaning uh because maulid applies to a lot of things but meaning specifying a, a day of the year uh uh for the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's Iqtilaf on the exact day when he was born, by the way. Not everybody believes it was the twelfth of Rabi'l Awal. You know, it's Ijma that he died on the twelfth, Monday the twelfth of Rabi'l Awal. But a lot of people also believe that he was born on the twelfth of Rabi'l Awal. And it's Iqtilaf about the birth date. But that death date, Ijma, is is consensus on the, that he died on that day. But it's not, it's Iqtilaf, it's difference of opinion on the fact that he was born on that day. So what we mean by Maulid in this situation is specifying a day for it, gathering for it, and doing things for that. Uh and uh according to the Shehu, uh he mentions this more than once in his Ihya Sunnah. This is uh, a makru innovation. He says it's a makru innovation if no blameworthy innovations take place there. In other words, everything that happens there is praiseworthy, right? It's still his position that it is a blameworthy innovation. And this is based upon his uh methodology within the school of Imam Malik. Notice I didn't say it was Imam Malik's opinion because the uh, Maulid and Nabi, the celebrating the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't take shape and didn't take form until after the time of Imam Malik. So Imam Malik never spoke directly about the celebrating the birth of the Prophet because it didn't exist at the time. So, uh, but even when you look at it, like the way I usually try to explain it, to, to simplify it, when you look at a gathering celebrating the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that doesn't have any blameworthy uh, innovations taking place, is nothing but good happening there. Like feeding people, you, you learning about the Sirah, you reciting poetry and praise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of these things. Like in the way the Shafi'is look at it, they look at it individually, like, Okay, all of these things are good things and all of these things are from the Sunnah. So the whole event in and of itself is a Sunnah. But the Malikis, well, most of the Malikis uh, don't look at it like that. They look at it as the gathering and combining all of these things together in, in one for that purpose is in and of itself uh, macro innovation. So when you see these things, uh, happening like the example that our brother Sidi Nasir is mentioning. If not, that's not your thing. You know, don't make in car because it's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaat. If that's not your thing, just leave. As the Shehu said, uh, 
Al-Inqar al-Muta'alakum bima ujmi'a ala ijabihi aw tahrimihi. There is no making inqar unless there is ijma'a. There is consensus about its obligation or its prohibition. In this case, there is no consensus about its obligation or its prohibition. Some of the scholars say that it's a blameworthy innovation. Some of them say it's a praiseworthy innovation and it's a sunnah. So, so that difference of opinion exists. And so the other extreme, you find some people who uh, support the celebrating the Mawlid, they will accuse those of Ahlul Sunnah who don't agree with them of being Wahhabis. <laughs> I've seen that. Oh, you're not Ahlul Sunnah, you're Wahhabis. You know, because, you know, Wahhabis, you know, they have a con conniption fit about the Mawlid. Oh, my God, they a Kufa shirt. But they celebrate the birth of Saudi Arabia every year, cut cakes and everything, just like the Kufa, right? With, with their birthday cakes and stuff. They do that. They quiet as, I don't know what. But they, like, they about to have a seizure. You mentioned Mawlid and Nabi around them. Like, oh, my God, right? So, you know, that's not our position. It's a difference of opinion even though some of the scholars like to hide it in order to pu push their position. They'll make it They'll make it seem like you don't love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam unless you do this. That's another extreme. You can't do that. That's why I've been saying every day, gotta watch these jokers. These guys are slick. Dudes be pushing their own agenda and you know, they'll make it seem like, okay, you. You don't do you don't you don't celebrate the Maulid. Therefore, you're a Wahhabi. No, you don't celebrate the, the, the Maulid, which the reason why you don't do it is because you don't love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And also you are a Wahhabi. And so I've seen that logic, and that's not true. If that's the case, then the Shehu didn't love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Uza Billah. Mandali. And and he was a Wahhabi. And, and we seek refuge with Allah from attributing that to, to the Shayu. Alhamdulillah. Okay, let me get out of here. Alhamdulillah. It's been good, inshallah. Please uh, tune in to the Black Imam's Roundtable in a half hour at 7 o'clock on Masjid Muhammad of Atlantic City's YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, I do know uh, uh, Zachary, but I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, maybe I can look for that answer. Uh, I, I don't want to throw out there an approximate time, but I do know. But it was after the time of the Salaf, during the early period of the Khalaf. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik and ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa staghfiruka wa tubu ilayk wa la asra inna al-insana la fi khusra inna al-adhina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasaw bilhaqi wa tawasaw bilsabah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.